What is up, Mets Up listeners? Welcome back to episode number 86 of the Mets Up podcast, brought to you by the Seven Line. You can see me and James rocking some Seven Line t-shirts today. If you are watching the YouTube version of it, you can purchase these yourself at thesevenline.com. Make sure you do. It's this, the shirt's comfortable and it looks great as well. Big shout out to Darren for sending us some great t-shirts here, but that's not really necessarily what we're here to talk about. We are here to talk about the New York Mets versus the Arizona Diamondbacks series that happened this past weekend. You had a lot of games going on through Three games, some wins, some losses, a little bit of storyline here and there, but honestly, kind of a straightforward series. The Mets won games they played better in, and they lost a game they didn't play better in. So we'll go through everything as we always do every single episode. So make sure you guys are sticking around. Make sure you're following us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Mets up. You'll be able to find us there. If you're listening to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, drop us a rating, drop us a review. It really does help out. And you can follow me and James on Twitter at draftnickmark at Jeter had no range. James, what's up, man? How you doing? Doing good, dude. Long time no see. Only about a day since yeah. our softball, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, dismantling? Yeah, a route. We got destroyed in softball this weekend, guys. It was a mercy. We just played, we played like guys who definitely played baseball and then also had been playing softball for years. It was just, it was really a David versus Goliath situation. It felt like this weekend. Yeah, not good. But hey, that's why we got the Mets. That's why we got the Mets. Now, we started off with game one, and this is probably the most interesting of all the games this series because. Got a, got a little bit of everything here. Start off, though, with David Peterson on the mound, who looked really good again. David Peterson is, I, I don't even want to say surprising us anymore, because I think this just might be the David Peterson that we ex- should have been expecting and are now going to see. Yeah, David Peterson being a league average pitcher. I told all you guys this was something that I thought could happen in March after a really bad spring training outing that had people wanting to kill him <laughs> on social media. And now we're looking here in the the weekend of uh, April 21st, and David Peterson matched a very, very talented Zach Gallen for over five innings. He went five and two-thirds, three strikeouts, three hits, just one walk, just one earned run. That's all very, very good for David Peterson. And the big adjustment that he's made, that's now officially seems like it's like locked in stone, cemented, this is the new David Peterson, is that he's just not a sinker baller anymore. He throws four-seam fastballs. He threw 38% four-seam fastballs on Friday night versus just 9% sinkers. Some of the fewest sinkers I've ever seen David Peterson throw in a start. And he touched 96 miles an hour again with that four-seamer and sat 94-95. Like, big guy like him, that's all you need to succeed. And again, maybe explain to the viewers because it's been a while since we've really had like the four-seam sinker talk. But explain like why all last year you were banging the drum for David Peterson to drop the sinker and why it seems like this could be a huge reason that he's taken a step forward. Well, Peters, Peterson specifically last year was just getting significantly more whiffs on his four-seam fastball compared to a sinker. And a lot of times pitchers are successful throwing sinkers when either the pitch has plus movement, either like a fade going out or just the drop that it goes down. Uh, classic sinker and David Peterson didn't really have either of those so he just ended up throwing a lot of sinkers that were hittable and he wasn't really getting the soft contact you want from most sinkers and he was keeping the ball on the ground mostly yes but wasn't keeping the ball on the ground enough to really suppress his uh, suppress hard contact from the other team and eventually runs so the fact that he's fully made this adjustment probably listen to the messed up podcast we're going to be honest like is a whole new guy and he matched Gallon Gallon for the second week in a row Really, really held the Mets in check. They didn't hit the ball harder than 97 miles, 97 and a half miles an hour against him. He had seven strikeouts. They were just 20 combined knuckle curveballs and changeups, which are Gallon's two bread and butter whiff pitches. And those two got six whiffs on the few 10 swings they got. We did just scratch one run across against him on a Nimmo double. But to have David Peterson, our proverbial fifth starter, go up against another team's theoretical ace and be able to put us in position to win the game is just incredibly important to it. Long-term success. Yeah, I'm pretty confident in saying Zach Allen owns the Mets. It feels like every time yeah. he pitches against us. I mean, he's, he's really good. He's twice super talented. Yeah, twice in a week. Really talented. Seems like Brent Strom over there has probably helped his game a little bit because he was so sharp, but it was so nice that we got to see him leave the game relatively early again. I mean, he didn't go super deep into this game, mm-hmm. and we got to jump all over this Arizona Diamondbacks bullpen, which is just simply not very good. Yeah, I mean, I really thought you were going a different direction because the first guy out of this Arizona Diamondbacks bullpen on Friday night was none other than Mets legend Oliver Perez, and it feels so fucking good to hit that guy hard. I can't even tell you. Yeah, I I respect that he's still playing Major League Baseball. It's pretty impressive for a guy who mm-hmm. is not that good ever Mm -mm. he always 
we, we know the story of Oliver Perez, and that's got him when he was this young, budding prospect, and he was he was on the precipice of being the next great left-handed starting pitcher at Major League Baseball. And then the 2006 playoffs happened, and we don't even remember what happened there with Oliver Perez. 2007, Friday night against the Marlins, too, last game of the year, gave up, I think it was five runs in the first inning on the series that the Mets needed to win two games against one of the worst teams in baseball just to make the playoffs and stop their horrific collapse. Couldn't do that. Yeah, no, he definitely was, uh, he doesn't hold a soft spot, I feel like, in Mets no. fans' heart. It's impressive he's still out there, sure. but also it's because he's on the Diamondbacks and they were looking for anybody, it seems like, to get these last few spots in their bullpen. Albert Perez did have a few recently okay years. I want to say it was with Cleveland a couple years ago. He was brought on as a lefty, left-handed left specialist and was passable as an upper a guy in his old, upper 30s. Which is like, I, I, I laughed at that sentence if you guys aren't watching the YouTube video, because James, he was... He was passable. He was almost. he was almost okay. Like that's <laughs> that's the kind of pitcher that we're talking about for what was one of his better seasons. And now, like you said, we have forty year old geriatric Oliver Perez who's got a little salt and pepper hair going on. He drops it drops it down low and comes sidearm with all these herky jerky stuff. He tries to use deception. Didn't work. He got absolutely smashed. Yeah, Nemo and Marte had two quick singles against him and then Lindor and Pete each had productive outs to drive them home. Which Great. is nice. I mean, good baseball. good baseball. Good baseball. Getting runs. And then let's talk about the bomb heard around the world by James friggin' McCann. The, you see this swing. when If you, in a vacuum, saw James McCann take this at bat and this swing, you would go, that's one of the best hitting catchers <laughs> in all of baseball. One the, of the best, most powerful hitters in all of baseball. He crushed it 450 <laughs> feet off J.B. Wendell. Can again, not much of a, a pitcher there on the hey. other side. Well, this doesn't matter that much. You, doesn't, you hit against who's pitching. Still hit it 450 feet. Absolutely crushed it. And I was like, there he is. James McCann, the $40 million man. That's the guy we've been waiting for. It was huge. It was a big home run. Really uh, really kind of pushed this offense to the next level here in this game. And at least it just gave us like what at the time felt like and seemed like breathing room. That, again, at the time, it felt like that was something we were going to want, something we were going to need. And... and- it did wind boy. up to be true. Yeah, boy, did we need it because the bullpen got a little shaky. Got mm-hmm. a little shaky. Trey's and Shreve, who's been good for us all year, got a little bit into a little bit of trouble. Wasn't necessarily, you know, the tightest in this game. And then uh, Trevor May. This is where, again, we kind of ran into a little bit of trouble, a little bit here, a little bit there. Trevor May comes into the game after an up-down, which is now, what, the second or third time? Something like that. And he this was this wasn't up down in the sense that he pitched and then went back to the bench and came back out, but this was still more of just like something that he has done in the past because he got the last out of Shreve's inning, got us into the dugout, then he came back for the eighth right after. Yeah, so it wasn't necessarily like a full inning, sit down, come back in. It was like you said, that one out, come mm-hmm. back in. So he he didn't throw a lot and he didn't even really pitch bad in this inning. That's the thing. He got kinda like just unlucky like the home run that he gave up to Christian Walker which is the one that you know everyone's talking about that ball was so in on his hands I don't know how Christian Walker got the bat around on it it was a fastball in and he just hit it 360 feet for a home run that made the game a hell of a lot closer yeah well, literally a one run game and Christian Walker I think all Mets fans would agree after watching this series is a better hitter than he gets credit for in the national baseball landscape he doesn't really swing at very many bad pitches he has Plenty of power, enough to be a starting caliber player in this league. And if you are like into advanced stats and you want to look up like the expected stats versus the guy's actual stats, Christian Walker so far this year has been one of the unluckiest players in baseball in terms of batted ball luck. So he could play a little bit. And I think the Mets saw firsthand that if there is any hitter in this lineup worth worth half his weight besides Ketel Marte, it's Christian Walker. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, he definitely gave us a little bit of trouble this series. He had a couple home runs, I believe, right? He had two, I think, this series. Well, yeah, the, the one that he hit on Sunday was just, that was, like, I felt bad for that ball. It had a family. Yeah, no, like, he absolutely crushed it. James McCann did, I think you could say. <laughs> oh, Jesus, not saying that. <laughs> you, won't, you won't go that far. I won't say that. But, yeah, here we go. We got a one-run game now, going into the ninth, and Edwin yeah. comes in, and Edwin's been so, so good this year. We've talked mm-hmm. about it. He's been absolutely great. And, honestly, in this inning, he would be made. He made one bad pitch. He was pretty filthy. Otherwise, yeah. it just happened to be a slider that didn't slide. In fact, just yeah. stayed right down the middle. And Dalton Varsho, who one of the guys we talk about every time with the Arizona Diamondbacks, is a guy to watch. Does Dalton Varsho things? Hits a ball really, really hard. Hits it over the fence, and we got a tie ball game. Yeah, and this is something I feel like Edwin has made a, put a greater emphasis emphasis on so far this year, and that's just using more sliders, especially 
to left-handed batters. He did that a lot against Bryce Harper in that Philly series where you start that slider right down the middle, and then just with how much Edwin Diaz's uh, slider breaks and moves, you start it down the middle. It winds up just off the inner half, basically a hard back footer. That's usually David Peterson special against uh, right-handed hitters, but this one just didn't move enough, and Dahl Varsha got enough barrel on it. He he got he hit 103 miles an hour. Still barely got over the fence, but it was just it was not a good pitch, and Edwin Diaz can't leave that pitcher. And he's getting very slider happy this season, even as a guy who has one of the better fastballs in all of baseball. Yeah, that's something I've noticed is it feels like, you know, if you were playing MLB The Show, you know how X is like the main pitch. That's the yeah. pitch that like is supposed to be their best one. Uh-huh. It feels like Edwin Diaz right now just switched from the four seam to slider because it feels like right now, I don't know what the percentage is over the season, but I, I got to imagine the slider's been the pitch he's thrown the most. And granted, it's worked, so I'm not complaining, yeah. but definitely, like you said, this is something that can happen when you are a guy like Edwin Diaz, whose slider does snap so hard that if you just don't get it, it's going to be down the middle and it's going to be crushed. In this game specifically, this outing, Edwin threw 14 pitches. You want to guess how many fastballs he threw just from watching it and remembering? Four. He threw four fastballs and 10 sliders. And that's, I guess, as electric as slider has been, sure, but you just you run such a risk. I and mean, that's just, this is just the, the deal with Edwin Diaz. Like His pitches are so crazy that he's going to throw them in kind of not the best locations ever because it's, that's not that's not his jam. I'd rather Edwin Diaz be a big stuff guy over a big location guy. But same with his fastball in 2019, 2020, when there were a lot of home runs hit against him. Like you try to throw it up, it just gets middle, and a guy doesn't take as much when you've already made good contact when Edwin Diaz pitched to send it over the fence. That is the issue with a guy like him. That's a good issue to have because it means his stuff is just really really good, and this doesn't happen that often. But it happened that this night, and I was I was very upset, nervous, and scared that the Mets were about to blow a a large lead against a bad team. I will say I was proud of Mets Twitter. Uh, I did not see too much freaking out. The sky is falling. Edwin Diaz's terrible comments. It seemed pretty calm. It was like, hey, it happens. It feels like there's a little bit, little bit of a different vibe right now on Mets Twitter. A little more positivity maybe than there has been. And we also know that Joel is the scapegoat for everything. So, Yeah, and we also have 12 wins in, in April, so we're, we're good. Yeah, we're feeling good. Let's talk about the next thing, though, because, of course, game tied up. Mets have to come up for the 10th. And we get to face our right-handed Brad Hand, which is Mark Melanson. The pitching version of Adam Frazier. He is so not good. And like, we talk about Brad Hand is our famous not good pitcher who people think is good. Mark Melanson is truly the definition of everything we hate as a pitcher, it feels like. Yeah, literally. And you kind of saw it all on display in this inning. Because while Mark Melanson is very good at getting soft contact and getting out of innings and getting a lot of saves... A set that people liked, especially last year when he got so many saves for the Padres. There's a man on second to start the inning, and there's some athletic players coming to the plate, and just some generally good hitters. A lot of balls in play. They're going to find the hole. And eventually, the Mets got enough guys on, and Starling Marte legged out a nice infield single and got a run home. I thought for sure there was a 0% chance that they were overturning it. It was, that might honestly be the closest I've ever seen. Like they had, you you go frame by frame <laughs> normally, but I swear to God, the difference was one frame of Starling Marte being on the bag before it was in his glove. It was so incredibly close. I tweeted out the jinx, which was great. Great move mm-hmm. by me. I'm going to pat myself on the back for that one. I tweeted out, there's no way they overturned this. We didn't score a run. And what do you know? They made the big call. Everybody was pumped. The Mets get a run. Starling Marte, who's lost a little bit in the speed department. The stack cast numbers tell you that ever so slightly. But on that ball, he busted it down the line. And that's that's something that you don't necessarily see always like in a scorebook or if you look at you know box scores or anything like that. But that's one of the big things that Starling Marte brings to this team is that speed, that hustle, that energy. He won us a game right there. Especially as a guy who's making $20 million a season and is like, over 30 years old like that's just a rarity in, in modern baseball especially a guy like that with all those things i just mentioned he's even hitting closer to the top of the batting order like you just don't really see as much of an emphasis placed on effort and starting Marte, he got he got his money's worth for every single stride on that ground ball that he hit also helped that newly called up matt davidson decided to take it on a long hop deep in the hole at third base and just gave starting Marte, who's relatively fast even more time to get the first so we love that and now we have the bottom of the 10th inning And who are we going to go to? We go to Seth Lugo. And we know that Seth has been a little bit shaky this year. We've talked about a lot. It just didn't look like he had some of the stuff that we saw last year. He didn't look as sharp. Boy, did he shut that all down. Shout out to James, who said, Mm -hmm. I don't think it's really that bad. Because boy, oh boy, that's the Seth Lugo we've been waiting for. He was so good. Wow. You had a lot of energy in that one. Face got ready. Move your hair. 
I shook. I shook because I'm excited the Mets are winning games. No, and like, I mean, truthfully, you gave me the credit, but we kind of both have said it and have been saying it for the last few weeks. Like, if Seth Lugo can just simplify his repertoire, no more sinkers, no more sliders, fastballs and curveballs, and just keep the ball in the zone, people aren't going to hit him. And this inning just become <clears throat> just between the top of the 10th with the Mets putting a lot of not even that well-hit ground balls in play, and then Seth Lugo coming on the mound in a one-run game and striking out the first two dying back hitters he faced, you kind of saw, again, a microcosm for the difference between contact relievers and whiff relievers and why it's more valuable late in games to have a guy who's going to miss bats rather than a guy who's just going to get soft contact. Yeah, his uh, his the spin on his curveball, I believe, was a career high. It was sitting at like 3,400 RPMs, which, again, don't quote me on this, but I remember seeing tweets and stuff basically about how that was the most RPMs on a curveball this year, and we just don't really see a lot of people throwing it like that, and it had some just nasty late break I mean you saw it on the replays in slow motion where all of a sudden you know when it's in slow motion and you see the ball just boom just drop like that you're like that must be going fast so it was nice to see Seth Lugo step back come back really pitch well and the Mets a game that in years past this feels like a lock to lose Mm -hmm. they win this now I do want to mention a few just random things that did happen in this game because just some some intricacies, some minutia that we love to talk about. Pete Alonso was taken out early in this game in a 5-1 game for mm-hmm. Dom Smith for defense. Pete Spot did come up in this game mm-hmm. later on, so that was an interesting move. Can't do that in Arizona when we know runs get you know scored there like crazy. And then two, there's a moment where Robinson Cano got on the base late in the game, and we had Travis Jankowski available on the bench and did not pinch run for him. He was in the DH spot, so it's not like he had to play Jankowski at second base. I, I couldn't wrap my head around that process again. Didn't understand it, but I, it really didn't end up mattering at the end of the day. No, and good on you for those two, uh, those two uh, picking out those two things that mattered but didn't matter. Yes, oh, of course. Now let's talk about game two. <sighs> Umberto Castellanos, what the fuck? How? When you said during the last recap that it's clear that Zach Gallon has the Mets number, I was like, did you did you remember what happened in the second game? Because Umberto Castellanos just we we can't hit him now. Twice in one week, we've watched this guy just throw nothing in the strike zone, and not be able to do anything with it, and it's enraging. I don't know why or how. Like, I I say this, and it's not a joke. I don't think he would be the best high school pitcher in the state of New Jersey. He just he just has nothing. He, like you said, he doesn't even throw strikes. I don't know how he's on this team. I don't know how the Mets couldn't hit him. Frustrating to see a guy who throws, like, 85 with no movement just get the job done. I don't know how. This whole situation was made significantly worse when the lineups dropped before the game and we saw that your boy Robinson Cano was up in the sixth spot and a friend of the show, one of the best hitters in this Mets lineup, Jeff McNeil, was somehow in some way hitting eighth. It's crazy. It's absolutely nuts. There's there's no world. There's no world in 2022 where Robinson Cano should be getting, in theory, more at-bats than Jeff McNeil, especially yeah. with how both of them have played this year. Dominic Smith also hit six in this game. So at this point, the Mets drew up a lineup that had six, seven, and eight hitters, all left-handed. A situation that did come up late in this game. We, the Mets, we'll get to it later, but the Mets did have their ninth inning due up with six, seven, eight, and it was three lefties. So you're kind of just inviting the other manager to find an advantage over you when you're starting the game with lefty, lefty, lefty at any point in your batting order. So just... just with being a little afraid of Humberto Castellanos seeing him the second time, it didn't feel great. And then the fact that the Mets just put out one of those classic Mets lineups where I'm like, why, why, who, how, why'd you put it together this way? It didn't feel that good. But I thought things were going to be different off the bat because Brandon Nimmo did what he does. And he drew a nine-pitch walk to start the game. And I'm not even exaggerating when I say that was the most difficult at bat to Humberto Castellanos face the rest of the game because there was not, not almost nothing else happened here. He, in two starts now against the Mets, dating back to last week, he has thrown nine innings against them. Five hits, two earned runs, and six strikeouts. Like, what the fuck? How's that happen? Is, is he the Chase Anderson boogie monster? Chase Anderson, we sent him to Japan. Is Alberto Castellanos the new guy? We, we, saw, we saw this guy twice in a week. You saw him twice in a week. Couldn't hit him. <sighs> I think if the Mets weren't playing such good baseball, and like you said, didn't have 12 wins, this 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 would be a bigger problem. Yeah. But really, at the end of the day, when you're a 12-win team, like it's okay, you can lose some games. And that's just kind of what this game felt like. I mean, Trevor Williams was on the mound for us in the beginning and just kind of dinked and doinked him again, like all over the place. They just were kind of sharper than the Mets in this game, it felt like, at least. I don't even think it was sharper. It was just that their ground balls and lazy fly balls were finding holes while ours kind of were not. Like, we only had four hard hit balls against Humberto Castellanos in five innings, sure. And then, hilariously, the Diamondbacks in the first five innings also only had four hard hit balls. Theirs just turned into more runs. Like, that's going to happen. That's baseball, Susan. And 
It's just this, this Trevor Williams isn't really a starting pitcher in this league anymore. He, I don't know if, what he ever really was. He has value to this team, and he has been effective at times, but he's just not. It's hard to just like start the game, and that's Trevor Williams again. They, they didn't hit him hard. It, they didn't. They just put it where they, we ain't, and it sucks that the Mets, who have been pitching so well, and all their starting pitchers have been so lockstep that because of a stupid rainout that we had nothing to do with, we had to shuffle our rotation and use a six starter. Like that yeah. sucks. Basically. Rain cost the Mets a win basically this season so far. Yeah, pretty much because that that weird doubleheader definitely made it you know peculiar with the pitching rotation and how you're gonna line up guys here. And there's we no t- fault. That's just that's just how it is. That's how just it is. How it is. We, yeah. we just don't have a good six starter right now with injuries. That's not uh that's not complaining. We're just we're airing grievances at this point. Yeah, just saying. But we did try and rally back here. Jeff McNeil in the fifth. It's just funny because we talked about Jeff McNeil and how great he's been. Mm-hmm. Great, great triple, dudes. He's just such a good ball player. He's so good. He's making moves. He's making moves, and he's hitting certainly well enough to not be hitting eighth. I would say he's hitting well enough to either be hitting fourth, fifth, sixth, or even second, depending on how we could shuffle this lineup up. But Yeah, he's, he's been a huge part of the offense. Yeah, him hitting eighth is is crazy. I'm happy that it, it kind of worked out in this situation. You got RBI triple, who was imme- he was also immediately driven in by Tomas Nido with an RBI single. And then you have Brandon Nimmo up, the chance to keep this rally going, turn the, turn the lineup over. He had a lazy line drive to Geraldo Perdomo, who was playing just to the right of second base. And Tomas Nido was just bolting the second out of nowhere. He just he took off right when the pitch was running. He's like, I'm scoring first on a single, baby. I'm Tomas Nido. And he was just very, very lazily thrown out from there. He may have thought there were two outs, I don't know. Or he just might have he might have not been totally aware of the shift that was being played and thought the ball got through. But I was just like, oh, fuck. That was like the one little rally we had, and the air was completely taken out of the sails. Yeah, again, kind of goes back to my thing. I just it wasn't it wasn't a sharp game for the Mets, no. kind of on any aspect of what was going on. Shout to Sean Reed Foley though; he did pitch well in the two and two thirds innings that he was out there for the Mets. He gave us much needed length, which mm-hmm. when Trevor Williams only went what two, I think, in the game, that's yeah, it just it helps out a lot. Yeah, then after Reed Foley came in for those two and two thirds innings, Adebayo came in for him with a two one in the fifth, and he got out of a jam. Good, kept the Mets in the game. And, of course, he came back out for the sixth after an up-down, and he gave up a run. So now this is, again, becoming a theme. Every single game that we're seeing, when the Mets bullpen does give up a run, it's because someone came in, sat down, stood up. And not saying that these guys can't do that. Like, they can do that. Like, Adam Montevideo did this six times last year, pitched more than one full inning. But ironically, he didn't do that once last year until May 26th. So it's kind of a situation where maybe he got more warm, or maybe the, the team just got more used to him, but... I just don't know why this is becoming such a thing with the Mets bullpen. Why they're so insistent on guys coming in, sitting down, and coming back out. Like it's, it's happening almost on a per game basis right now, and it's clear that it affects these pitchers' effectiveness. I know it, there's a world where I wish these guys could sit down and come back up. That's how relievers used to be back in the good old days. But it's just it doesn't seem like this is the way these guys were developed or brought up or the way they were intended to be used, ever. Yeah, I'd really love to pick Buck's brain about this one because they're. There has to be, we we bring up process again because that's our favorite word of this pod, podcast, but is there something that the Mets see or that Buck Showalter, Jeremy Hefner, is there something that is leading them to make these decisions? Because like you said, these guys kind of do it later in the year normally after they're warming up. Are they trying to like artificially get these guys more stretched out because of the lack of spring training? Like I'm just trying to get my mind on the idea as, as to why it feels like every single game there is at least one reliever who tries and come out for a like second inning of work, theoretically. I think it's been a situation early on this season where the Mets know that their pitching depth is being tested, and it's probably a little bit thinner than they would like it to be or they expect it to be this early in the year. So they're just trying to squeeze like a little bit more out of every guy. If every guy gives five extra percent, that can get you through a whole another day and then get you to maybe Taiwan becoming healthy next week, and then the Pearson comes back up. Hopefully one day Jacob deGrom comes back, and eventually you can like everyone bands together to fill the voids left right now by the guys who are not here. But it just seems like it's kind of biting the Mets in the ass more than not, in their ass more than not, and we should just maybe be using more relievers on a daily basis. Yeah, I mean, something something to keep an eye out for. We'll continue to do that. And this game, again, like just, just not particularly sharp. We got guys no. on base every single inning, and just we couldn't get that hit that mm-hmm. really pushed us through and made this a ball game. Yeah, there was there was one particular exchange in the, I think it was the 7th or 8th inning of this game. Maybe the 7th, whatever. Maybe the 6th. I don't know. But there was this, Robinson Cano got a leadoff single. Leadoff single, nobody on. And then Jeff McNeil's up at the plate. Wild pitch. Robinson Cano advances to second base, which I know how reluctant I'm sure he was to, to do that. <laughs> he hustle a little <laughs> bit in the base pads. 
when Robinson Cano is standing on second base and Jeff McNeil hits just an absolute screamer up the middle, and who is standing there without an inch of se- an inch of space in either direction but Mr. Robinson Cano, and the ball just clanks right off his ankle. A situation that probably would have scored the Mets a run, at least would have had runners in the corners with nobody out, turned into just a man on first with nobody out. And it's just shit like that was going on all game. They just out. couldn't. With one out, yeah, man on first with one out. You're right, yeah. sorry, my bad. It's just shit like that was going on all game. It didn't seem like the Mets could really string together enough hits in order to get through for enough runs to make this competitive. And a lot of that is just, yeah, I don't know. You wake up Sometimes you wake up on the wrong side of the bed. Sometimes you don't execute. Sometimes you can't hit. That's part of the game. But the way this lineup was drawn up, I don't know. It just seemed like there were just ebbs and flows of it, peaks and valleys, where there wasn't enough to sustain. Yeah, they, it, there was no continuity it felt like in this lineup it just felt like everyone was kind of slightly off with the feng shui of how this lineup should have been moving and talk about moving the strike zone was moving on the Mets all game here Pete Alonzo was punched out on a ball that was probably like two inches below the plate he had some words to say to the home plate umpire and Pete very rarely has words to say to an umpire and there were just a lot of calls all over the place in this game we were just like what why is that a strike like it's just, it was a weird game weird game bad loss whatever you got to hit you can't win them all this is one they're gonna lose yeah, I mean, the the big story is you just you can't win them all, but you definitely shouldn't be losing to Humberto Castellanos. No, and also this may be even just the karma game because the Mets probably shouldn't have won the Friday night game between how well Zach Allen pitched and just the miracle that they were able to pull it out after blowing it. And also the absurd strike three call to Cattell Marte, which was, yeah, I mean, talk at his that. ankles that scraped the ground. Completely <laughs> forgot about that because, again, when we win, I don't need to worry about how we got lucky <laughs> and won that game. We just won. We're good. Yeah, so, yeah, maybe it's just the karma game for the Mets. You got to flush out the bad energy with a, with a loss like this, and then bring the good stuff back in. And luckily for the Mets, the good stuff did come back in on Sunday because we had Tyler Big Drip Drip McGill on the mound, and he looked fantastic once again. He's just so good. He's so good. I was able to uh, just watch this game a little bit at Greek Easter with the Greek family out in uh, mm. Yonkers, having a, having a good time eating some lamb. They also put a goat on the spit, which yeah, spit. I, you had the spit going. We had the spit going, so wow. the lamb and the goat. I don't touch the goat. I had it once. It's metallic. I don't care for it. But the <laughs> lamb, let me tell you, unbelievable. That skin, oh, it's just it's fantastic. A real, real good day of food and drinks, and also a good day because the Mets they ended up winning this game, as you guys know. And Tyler McGill, like you said, again, just continues to keep rolling and show that he is he's here and he's here to stay. He is. He's definitely here to stay. And also, I just love, I love when my pitcher can get to the mound with a run behind them already. Especially, especially after the awful night of offense on Saturday that the Mets were able to quickly get on the board. Mark Hanna, infield single. Kevin Alcantara, first of a, a few errors in this game, scoring on a Lindor base knock. It's also really cool that the Mets can sit Brandon Nimmo, give him a day, especially coming off COVID, which we know affects people in different ways. I'm sure he was probably a little lethargic or something. And just Mark Hanna can step into the, the leadoff shoes and be able to fill it with and pass with flying colors. Even though he didn't really have that many good at-bats in this game, just getting on base to start the game and be ready for your two, three, and four hitters, that's what that's the leadoff hitter's job. Well, yeah, it's so massive to get on base in the first inning because when we have a good lineup like this with Lindor and Pete and Marte and all these guys and Escobar who can come up and drive in runs, you have the opportunity, like you said, to get ahead early and really put the other team on pressure, like put pressure on them right from the get-go. And we saw that when Lindor got the quick RBI with Canik getting on base in the first inning. So it's like you said, it's really nice. It's a great luxury that this Mets team has. Mm -hmm. And also I fucking love Francisco Lindor. Dude had another great game today. Yeah. Awesome. The guy plays everywhere, but it's even just funny that we're even talking about the Mets having like a backup leadoff hitter when we went like almost 10 full years without having even any leadoff hitter, any semblance of a leadoff hitter in this roster. It went Jose Reyes, nobody, now Brandon Nemo. It's yeah. it's kind of, and there's a lot in between there, and it's funny too that you bring up like, you know, scoring in the first inning, getting guys on base. Like even if Canada didn't have the greatest at bats today, he got on base. Mm-hmm. And I remember when Jose Reyes used to be the on base machine at the top of the order for the Mets. They're like, if he gets on base, on base machine's a stretch. Jose Reyes, he well, he made a habit of not getting on base as often as he should have. Okay, fine. Maybe he <laughs> didn't have the greatest plate discipline, but I mean. In his prime with the Mets, he was getting on base like 350, 360, 36% of the time. That's really good for Jose Reyes, especially with his speed. But moral of the story here is I remember the stat that used to pop up on screen is that when Jose Reyes got on base and scored the first run of the game for the Mets, they typically tend to win games. And that's something that this Mets team we've seen has been able to do early, get on the board early and pitch comfortably with the lead. Yes, and that was very, very important for Tyler McGill because he just, with that lead starting off, he just completely bodied this not-so-good Diamondbacks lineup the way any good pitcher should to a bad lineup. He had more whiffs 
with one out in the second inning of this game that Madison Bumgarner had the entire game. Which I love to hear because fuck yes. Madison Bumgarner. Yeah, and Madison Bumgarner is doing this bullshit right now where everyone thinks he's still like good or he got it back, even though he's his stuff is not very good. He's I think he's given up only one run this year in ten innings of work or something like that. Maybe yeah, two he's, fifteen. He's done the thing like you said where he avoids bad results, but if you dive deeper into the soup, you you'd know it's not very flavorful. <laughs> There were two just ridiculous sentences there, but <laughs> yeah. I wanted to throw something crazy yeah. out there. Basically, they were throwing, like, Gary and Ron, of course they're going to do this. Like, they were throwing the round, like, a big pitcher's duel coming up here, and Tyler McGill went step for step at Madison Bumgarner. But Tyler McGill is so much better than Madison Bumgarner. It's, like, not even funny. Like, Tyler McGill is is a really good pitcher. Madison Bumgarner is just trying to get through his games. And to, Madison Bumgarner will get through his games. He'll probably end up with a decent stat, uh, stat line at the end of the year, but we're talking about Tyler McGill. His final line on Sunday was six and two-thirds innings, which is... Almost the longest start of his entire career. He almost got through the seventh. I really wanted him to because he only did that one other time, but whatever. Six and two-thirds innings pitch, five hits, two earned, one walk, seven strikeouts. Like, frick yeah. The only time he did ever complete seven was that Friday night Subway Series game from last summer against the Yankees. And he just, in the black jersey, just completely just manhandled the Yankees lineup. When That was the first time we are like, not the first time, but that was the first time after he was bad for like basically a full month straight. We were like, all right, this guy, this guy, still, this guy still wants it. This guy still has it. I just love that he pounds the zone. Absolutely mm-hmm. the thing. pounds the zone. Doesn't walk anybody. Like you keep uh, keeping your defense in the game. Tyler McGill does it. There is no like, oh my god, three and one again. Oh my god, <laughs> three and two again. Like he's just, he's really in control on the mound. He looks unbelievably comfortable. And again, the confidence is something we've talked about from the start. Big dick energy for big drip there. Big drip. He just he really does get on the mound and think he's the best pitcher on like in the world. I feel like. Yeah, for sure. And he's doing this all, and we're going to keep saying this, at still throwing 60% fastballs. It doesn't matter. Dimebacks swung at 26 fastballs in this game, and they whiffed seven times, which is a pretty good whiff rate. Not great. And they also had, he also got 12, McGill also got 12 call strikes with that pitch. So he's just telling you, I'm throwing a 97 mile an hour fastball right at you. You can hit it, or you cannot. You're probably not going to because you're not as good as me, but this is going to happen. The confidence, the cockiness, the swagger is unbelievable. And with that, his change up in the slider, they still look good. Everything good is still there. And I don't know if you guys noticed this watching, but Tyler McGill, who doesn't very often throw a curveball, he dropped a very sneaky curveball on David Peralta with one strike in the first inning. He only threw three three others the rest of the game, but just showing a veteran hitter a pitch that probably was barely in their scouting report in the first inning, that's a really savvy move from the from the young uh, young right-hander McGill. Yeah, and I, I think they mentioned on the broadcast, too, something that I think we've even spoken about before, but it's just really nice that these pitchers seem to be getting together every time they're on the mound and they're talking to each other and they're sharing information they're sharing knowledge and how, what do you want more than Max Scherzer to have a conversation with Tyler McGill about pitching I mean we talked about Bassett like going through the lineup before and then showing a curveball second time through or third time mm-hmm. through and we see McGill starting to experiment a little bit more with the curveball like, I think these are all things that are starting to rub off on each other and this is another reason why they're all pitching so well is they're just really focused on the game. They all want to get better. And when you have one of the greatest pitchers of all time in Max Scherzer, who's also a part of this inner circle, I mean, wow. I, oh, yeah, I'll say that. I'll say that for sure. He's sick. Uh, I mean, it can only mean good things. Only mean good things. Literally, right after he left the mound, and Gary and Ron were talking about this a lot, like, McGill went right to Scherzer, and they sat down and had a very animated conversation for a while. They were, like, laughing a little bit, too. They were using some, like, hand gestures. Like, they seem like they're becoming friends. They almost kind of look alike a little bit, too, which is the big, big white guys. It's also really got to be sick for Tyler McGill, who said what his favorite pitcher growing up was Max Scherzer. I remember in spring training, they talked about it. He's like, I had a catch with Max Scherzer today. <laughs> like he, couldn't, he couldn't believe it. Now he's he's chumly with you know Max Scherzer on the bench talking about pitch sequencing. Probably like that's got to be so freaking cool. And also even past Scherzer, like I love again what Scherzer means to this team. But like Carlos Carrasco has had an illustrious career. Chris Bassett is a grizzled veteran. Like these between those three guys, like you have a lifetime of baseball knowledge. And for a young pitcher like Tyler McGill and David Peterson was doing this too on Friday night to be able to sit there and soak that up and like take all of that in, it's invaluable to growth and development. Something with, that doesn't show up on the stat sheet. With the great brain of Jeremy Hefner? I mean, boy, oh boy, the Mets have really got some pitching magic going on right now. Freaking awesome. The only blemish from this incredible Tyler McGill outing, another incredible Tyler McGill outing, was, well, not getting out of that seventh inning. Just he got the six and two thirds and gave it back-to-back hits, whatever. But the Christian Walker home run that we referenced before, yeah. that was one of the furthest home runs I've ever seen in the game. It's like 460 feet. I said it earlier, it was McCann-like. 
Yeah, also Buxton crossed it past it today with his second home run, too. Yeah, you know, he's pretty sick. And we did kind of keep it close with the Diamondbacks. Like, we yeah, mentioned that early run. We, we meandered. Yeah, we, we like to make the Mets fans sweat. We were all sweating. I was sweating at Greek Easter, and it wasn't from <laughs> food coma, food sweats. Mets were keeping it close, but again, thank God for Sergio Alcantara, who somehow hit his one lone home run ever against us. He made up for it because he stunk today. Dude, he also, okay, well, we mentioned before, Sergio Alcantara made, well, I think, wound up being three errors in this game. And this came on the heels of Saturday night where he made two plays at third base that each made my jaw drop. One in the ninth inning against J.D. Davis, a nice ball down the line. He did full extension dive up in one motion and threw a dart across the diamond to end the game. And also he had one earlier in the game in the hole. I forgot who it was on. Starling Marte hit the ball kind of in the gap. I don't even know if I'll call it in the gap. <laughs> and... uh it was just it was just a play of Dalton Varsho. Like he was almost too athletic to really corral, and he overran it, slid, it hit off his chest, and Sally Marte Cruz in the second with a what would have been a hustle double, but turned out just to be a double because Varsho dropped the ball. With Lindor up, Starling immediately got a, basically a walking lead and stole third. He had beat the throw by about a step. Sir, uh, Alcantara could not handle the throw. Sally Marte walked in after being obstructed by Alcantara. The ball got so far away that even after being obstructed. With Alcantara laying down in front of him and blocking his pathway to the home plate, Stalling was able to jog in and get like a very, a, a, a much needed insurance run at the time. Right, that was actually take the lead. That was take the lead, yeah. And Stalling Marte got a big run that wound up that giving, that gave us the lead, a lead that we would not relinquish. And then later after that, still sticking with just a bad, bad Diamondbacks bullpen, they loaded the bases on a hit, a walk, and a hit by pitch of James McCann. Which every single time James McCann gets hit by a pitch, an angel gets their wings. Is nothing better than James McCann taking a, taking a ball off his arm. And Buck gave the the look at the top step. And Edwin Yuseda, who's had stuff in the past that I thought was okay. He came into this game and he just had no had no semblance of the strike zone. I mentioned before, J.D. Davis walked. Guillaume got a base hit. James McCann was hit by the pitch. Like I said, the angel flew away. And then as a pitcher, and you're facing Travis Jankowski with the bases loaded, one man out. You set to through four balls to Travis Jankowski in a row. He walked him on four pitches with the bases loaded in a one-run game in the seventh inning. Like, Ron was so disgusted by this performance from a relief pitcher. He's like, I can't believe that, man. What are you doing? You're, this is your job here. You got to throw a strike to the guy. Like, even, like, insinuating, like, this is Travis Jankowski. Like, what the hell are you doing here, dude? And after that, you said to actually did get Mark Hanna to fly out. So it looked like the Dimebacks were going to get out of this, only allowing one run, miraculously, with the bases loaded, not being able to throw one strike. And Taylor Widener comes into the game, a guy who we shouted out for being bad, even the last time in Bags preview. He promptly hits Starling Marte with a pitch. So the Mets got two runs in the seventh inning of this game on a bases loaded walk and a bases loaded hit by pitch in just the chaos of bad teams' bullpens. Yeah, no, it was, it, listen, we'll take advantage of that bad team bullpen all day long. That's what I want to hear. Bad team bullpen screwing up like they were supposed to. That's not what we're normally used to hearing as Mets fans. So it's mm-hmm. very refreshing to see that a shit team played like shit. And that's why we were able to partially win this game as well. Also, J.D. Davis off yeah. the schneid. Home mm-hmm. run. I know he barreled up a couple balls. Well, he didn't technically barrel them, but he hit a couple balls hard against the Giants, which was a very good, you know, omen of what was to come. And he, he crushed this ball at right center field, right? Yeah, crushed it. Power alley. Off a right-handed pitcher, mind you. Still the same, that very same Taylor Widener. So it looks like maybe J.D. Davis is allowed to hit against right-handed pitchers late in games. I, you wouldn't have thought that from the way these last few weeks have played out, but J.D. Davis is, I'm telling you every Mets fan, he is allowed to hit against right-handed pitchers. And what you know? He can hit them well. Also, I want to shout out Eduardo Escobar, who right before the J.D. Davis home run hit an absolute screamer, also off of Widener. He hit three hard He hit three hard hit balls in this game and couldn't even get one base hit to show for it. He was oh, lacing five. the ball all over the yard. He had an O for today, and he had, like you said, like legit three hard hit baseballs. No doubt about it. it Tough been. day. Yeah, and you, I know Eduardo Escobar. So he almost hit that home run that you predicted before this series. He almost did. He got close to it. Yeah, and then we finally got one more run this game because Luis Guillorme or King, who another guy who he can be in the mix, including JD Davis. Like, wow, these guys can hit late in games. It's pretty unbelievable. He had a nice hustle double, and he scored on a very lazy ground ball that. Alcantara just completely botched at their base. He literally, he tried to do the thing where like you have your glove next to your body and he just completely missed the ball. And Luis Guillermo scored. That gave us a four-run lead and that was all she wrote. Yeah, Luis Guillermo, good day. Two for four on the day. Love mm-hmm. Luis playing himself Great into a little bit more playing time. We'll talk about the bench hierarchy after we wrap up this game. Lugo came in. He was good. He had an up-down as well, which there we go. Once mm-hmm. again, we got to talk about the up-down. He's, he's good. He looks like he's pretty much back, I can yeah. say. He didn't get one whiff in this game, the four outs he got, but 
he only threw four seam fastballs and curveballs. So this adjust, this seems to be an adjustment that was something that was uh, con- what's the word intentional and something that looks like may have stuck. Someone's listening to the Mets Sub podcast. That's you get in the head of Seth Lugo. That's all I'm gonna say. Mm-hmm. Jeremy Hafner, Jeremy Hafner, uh, award winning listener, avid avid listener. And then the game's over. Joe Ali comes in, wins the game. Put it in the books. That's all we want to talk about with this Diamondback series. Yes. Two out of the three games that we won. All you have to there, do. There's not a whole lot of detail. There's not a whole lot of craziness that did go on. The Mets win another series. and They've won, can, they've won every series they played this year. Yep. Five for five. Mm-hmm. Twelve wins on the year. Most wins in all of Major League Baseball. Hell yeah. Boom. All right. Now, let's talk about this bench hierarchy because we just, just teased it seconds ago. Yeah. A couple housekeeping elements here. A couple housekeeping things. I'm trying to figure out what the bench hierarchy is, mm-hmm. and I'm trying to figure out what it should be. I think me and you probably both have a ranking of who we trust the most as the bench guys right now, right? If you're going to say who's coming up, one, two, three, four, five. I would say and so. It, and of these five guys, you're talking about J.D. Davis, Dom Smith, Robinson Cano, Luis Guillorme, and just Jankowski? Yeah, Jankowski will throw him in there yeah. as well. Because he's, bench, he's on the bench. He's a bench guy. And I got a really good feeling that what we think the Mets hierarchy is is definitely not what we think it should be. No, it seems like the Mets hierarchy is probably some combination of Dom Smith and Robinson Cano at one, just because they also they are lefties. You're facing mostly righties in Major League Baseball season, so you want to get that lefty matchup. And in the game they played on Saturday, when McNeil, Dom, and Cano were all in the lineup, they went in the lineup, Dom, Cano, McNeil. So it seems like just based on that logic that – Dom is, I guess, a hair ahead of Cano right now in the hierarchy, and somehow, some way, they might both be ahead of Jeff McNeil, even though he's an established starter in this team and someone who should probably be hitting in the top half of the lineup, but whatever. And it just also seems like that J.D. Davis, early in the year, has been relegated to only getting at-bats against lefties, but it seems like we're getting to a spot now where we're, we're seeing Davis hit the ball significantly harder and with more authority than those other guys, and then I don't know what else there is about who should be getting more of these at-bats. Yeah, I mean, the way Robinson Cano is playing right now, it's not good. I, no, I think bad. that's a very normal take. That's not even me being like a hater or anything. He's not playing well. He's just not bringing a whole lot to the table. So if he's not hitting well, you have to give that time to Luis Guillorme, who is a good fielder and is actually putting the ball in play and making things happen. Like to me, if I'm Luis Guillorme, I'm, I'm like, how, how am I not in the game more? And I feel like <laughs> today, a two for four, that definitely helps. Like it has to help because he's, he's a good ball player. We've talked about it. For the last year plus doing this podcast, like he's never going to be the best player on the team. He's never going to be the best middle infielder in the league. He's never going to dominate. You're not going to watch Luis Guillorme play and go, oh my goodness, it's generational talent. But in the spot that he, in the role that he has, in the position he plays, he, he's better than Robinson Cano right now. And I feel like he's just got to get more time until he proves he doesn't deserve it, if that's a thing. Yeah, we should all be looking at the Mets DH situation kind of just like a pie chart. And you have these four names between, sorry, Travis Jankowski, but he, he has a role in this team. It's just not a guy who's going to be in the lineup more than one day a week. Yeah, and the and four, great, well, great backup outfielder. Great backup outfielder. Plays good defense. He's really fast. Puts his bat on the ball. Fantastic. He was left in for that bat against Camille Duvall. That's not his fault. That's okay. That's like letting your 15-year-old cousin drive your car. It's just you shouldn't have done it, and it's, it, you can't be mad when he crashes. But we have the pie chart right now of Cano, Dom, J.D. Guillorme. And right now, that pie chart, based on how playing time has wound up early in the year, you're kind of looking at like 50% Cano, 25% Dom, 15 Guillorme, 10 J.D. Davis. Right? Yeah, and that, that feels logically about how it's gone so far. Yeah, and especially because, like you said, like J.D., they're not going to hit him against righties, although he's proving yes. that he still hits the ball hard. And that's something we always knew with J.D. Davis, too, is that the boy can hit. He's There's never no been a bad doubt. Hitter. Never been a bad hitter. And it's just like, at some point, it's like, why is Cano getting this large of a section of this pie? There's no reason for it, really. At, they at least have to scale his back a little bit to get more defensive reps for Luis, Luis Guillorme and just a few more at-bats a week for J.D. Davis. Like, there's no reason for Robinson Cano for based on what he is right now and what we even expected him to be coming into the season to be getting this lion's share of the Mets' DH reps. It's just, it's really hard for me to reason that it doesn't make any sense. And I'm not, it's not costing the team wins, I'm not going to say that, but it's definitely... You're definitely losing an element that you could gain with either a J.D. Davis in the game who has consistently good at bats and hits the piss out of the ball, or Luis Guillorme, who is probably the best defensive second baseman on this entire roster. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, The bench hierarchy is something we're going to keep an eye out for here as we get going on further into the season because, like you said, Cano's been playing a lot, and the numbers aren't there. So is that going to get scaled back a little bit? Are we going to see a change? 
We'll find out as we keep going on here. Some other stuff, again, housekeeping to talk about. Jacob deGrom, today is a big day. You guys are listening to it on the day, so you probably already heard the news. But the boys are sweating because this is when we get the results back from Jacob deGrom's MRI on that shoulder. First whether one. What? This is the four-week MRI, right? Yeah. Whether or not he's going to be able to start rehab, go back to Florida, start throwing because he has not thrown yet. So this is big. This is big. Prayer circle, everybody. You got to cross your fingers, uh, sleep with a f- spoon underneath your pillow. I think it's what we did for snow days. Whatever you got to do days. tonight, we need all the good juju because this team has looked really, really good. And we've been missing the best pitcher in all of baseball without a doubt. Imagine what this team could look like if Jacob deGrom is back and healthy. I mean, ah, oh, it's huge. It's going to be so dumb listening to this back when the news comes out like at 10 o'clock in the morning or like n- noon. And we're going to know very quickly. And you guys are going to have had, had to listen to us talk about the Diamondbacks for 40 minutes. <laughs> when you even know that Jacob deGrom is going to pitch a simulated game or be out for the rest of the season. It's, it's just a constant hell of brewing for this team that your best player is always in the balance. Always, always in the balance. And Jacob deGrom, wishing the best. Wishing the best. Good news. We got any, I, don't, I don't have any wood around me right now. Um, oh, I got, a, I got a nice chest back here that I can knock on that's made of wood. We want all the good juju. As much ju- good juju as possible. And the other side of good juju is bad juju. And we're just going to briefly talk about this. We talked about this guy a lot in spring training, and now news came down over the weekend that Mike Confordo is getting an additional shoulder surgery, and he will, without having signed with the team, miss the entire season. Mike Confordo is a guy we saw play a lot. I feel bad for him that he got stuck in the situation, declined the qualifying offer, I'm sure, based on Scott Boris's instruction, and now has packed himself into a corner where he has to go a full year without earning money. And for any person on earth, that's a really hard thing. And I feel bad for Malcolm Ford, though, for that. Yeah, uh, he got Boris hard. Boris yeah. will do this to one player every single year, it feels like. And it just so happened to be Michael Conforto. Feels super bad for the dude, especially because when he hits the free agent market next year, it's going to be bleak. Yeah, I just it's going to be weird. Weird situation for him. It's, it could wind up being one of those like strange stories we look back on like, 10, 15 years as baseball fans being like, what the hell happened to Michael Conforto? Yeah, just... Stephen Drew, it happened to Stephen Drew. Yeah, it just does it. <laughs> just sometimes happens. It's unfortunate. Wish the best for Michael Conforto. Speedy recovery. All right, and before we go into the Cardinals preview, let's talk about this date coming up, May 1st, where the Mets have to cut down the roster from 28 to 26 players. Everyone you, has to cut down. Everyone in yeah, baseball. Yeah, it's not just Mets, but yeah, every, yeah. everybody <laughs> in base. No, only the Mets have to cut down their roster. They're playing the too Mets. well. Too many wins. <laughs> too many wins. You have to cut the roster. They're going from 28 to 26 players, and you have to carry 13 pitchers maximum. They're at 14 right now, so there's going to be at least one pitcher sent down, as well as the possibility of a bench guy. So that is something we'll talk about more going into the next episode, because this next week is basically like an extended spring training of the guys who have to prove themselves for these last final two spots. Whoever plays better it's probably who's going to come down to, because the Mets just don't have a lot of optionable players. Yeah, especially when the Mets, one of the, the Mets' most obvious optionable player is Adonis Medina, who came up and made uh, pitched very well in his Mets debut over this weekend against the Diamondbacks. He's probably going to be optioned this week to make room for Taiwan Walker, who's going to pitch a sim game, I think it was today when you guys are listening to this, Monday or Tuesday in St. Louis, and then he could make his turn through the rotation next weekend, which would be pretty damn cool to get Taiwan back that quickly after such a nice debut from him. But other than Medina, there's, there's three pitchers currently in the Mets roster with options, and they are Tyler McGill, who's not being sent down, Seth Lugo, who is not being sent down, and Drew Smith, who I hope won't be sent down, but he might end up just taking a week in the minor leagues just simply because of logistics, so the Mets don't have to cut either a Reed Foley or a Trevor Williams, who will like is likely to be picked up by another team. It, it feels like bad process to send down a better player because you don't want to lose a, a, a lesser pitcher, but we've seen crazier thing happen. Something we'll keep an eye out for definitely going on to this week. Let's talk about the next series, though. St. Louis Cardinals in St. Louis fucking hate playing there hate them hate this Absolutely. team hate that ballpark stupid i just want to beat them it feels like every time we go to st louis it's just like there's going to be a, there's a lock for an extra inning game that's going to go like 14 innings <laughs> it's gonna happen take not the more not with these yeah. rules no the mets will find a way the mets will find a way in st louis to play <laughs> well, 14 don't you remember that we had this conversation last year and then we debunked the myth that the mets get crushed by the cardinals in st louis the mets actually had a winning record against the cardinals dating back like an entire decade 
Yeah, I just I still don't believe that number. Even though, <laughs> even though it, I've seen it, I don't believe it because it it really does feel like every time we go there, it's like oh, it's just the Cardinal baseball. They're fucking annoying. And we also have a bad taste in our mouth because last year somehow the Cardinals broke our backs two separate times. One being that April May series that wound up getting Chili Davis fired, and the second one being the series at home later in the year that killed the Mets entire season. So. There's just the, the recency bias with this team, along with the deep history bias with this team. For our older listeners out there, thinking back to like the 70s, 80s, how much they hate the Cardinals, and just you and I, the people in our generation who remember 2006 oh so unfondly. It's upsetting, and I really hate that stupid bird sitting on the bat, I hate that dumb jersey, I hate the way their field looks so nice, all their really kind, stupid fans. I just want to beat this team. I'd like to beat this team three times, especially because they're a team we're going to be directly competing with this season. Whether they... They're not, there's no way the Cardinals, who are in first right now, run away with their division because the Brewers are too good of a team. So there's a good chance that the Mets are in direct competition with the Cardinals, whether it be in the playoffs or in the wild, or in the wild card race leading up to the playoffs. So winning these games is almost as important as winning your divisional games because yeah. of how directly we're going to be competing with them. Definitely. And, I mean, it gets started off nice for us. We get Max Scherzer going up against Miles Michaelis, which... Mm-hmm. That's that's a check mark in the Mets, you know, department right there of advantage. <laughs> yeah, but that's Game always two. how it goes. And then <laughs> Miles Michaelis is through six innings with three strikeouts, eight hard hit balls, and no runs. Umberto Castellanos, a better version uh, of him. <laughs> oh god. And then Tuesday night, we have Chris Bassett on the mound against newly minted starter Jordan Hicks. Who that's Ooh. Did you see the way he looked against the Marlins last week? I did not, because I was interested. Was he still throwing 125 miles an hour? <laughs> he, he cranked it up to 99 a few times, especially early, but his slider was unbelievable. and He just he looks like he can do this transition until his arm blows again. Yeah, I don't want the arm blowing out, but I, I also don't want him to be good against the Mets. So yeah. hopefully the transition phase slows down a little bit here against the New York Mets. And then game three, big one. Oh, yeah. for, for simply only one reason, and that's uh-huh. Steven Matz is pitching against the Mets, and boy, oh boy, would I love to just absolutely rock his bell. I mean, he's still basically the MVP of the Mets team this year, based on how much he motivated Steve Cohen. You get this bulletin board, uh, bulletin board material. Steven mm-hmm. Matz, this is he signed us Max Scherzer because he didn't even call back the Mets to give mm-hmm. them another chance to make an offer. How dare the local Steven Matz? Apparently, a great guy off the field, but great on guy the, off field, the field hasn't done much for the Mets ever, and. Although he might have helped them out here, but I'd really love to just absolutely shell Steven Matson game three with Carrasco on the mound. Yeah, for sure. It's also just cool to note when you look at these three games, it looks like, like on paper, it seems like the Mets have a pitching advantage in all three games. So you have a pitching advantage in all three games, you would hope to win at least two of them, if not all three. If the Mets could sweep the Cardinals, I'll jump up and down. If the Mets get swept by the Cardinals, I'm going to bury myself in a hole. <laughs> but I look at these three matchups. I'm like, all right, good. As long as you, everyone executes and we play the same good baseball we have been playing, we should be in position to win all of these games. Yeah, and I will say uh, we talked about how much bad baseball the Dimebacks play. The Cardinals will play good baseball. Very they good. play great defense. Uh, they run the base as well. These are mm-hmm. all things that Keith is going to just drool over as a Cardinal Hall of Famer as well. Uh. As that's just the stuff he really prioritizes in the game of baseball yeah. is defense and base running. And with that, the Cardinals have plenty of star power just between – Tyler O'Neill, Paul Goldschmidt, and Nolan Arenado. Who all yeah. uh, Goldschmidt's not really hitting that much this year. Arenado's crushing the ball, and Tyler O'Neill is a the man amongst boys on the baseball field. He is shredded. That guy's yeah, he's, he's absolute freak. Yeah, but I mean, otherwise, like this isn't really anything to watch for this series. Like we know how these Cardinals players. They're all veterans. Yadier Molina, you're gonna see. There's gonna be pictures of Wainwright in the dugout chewing gum like the asshole he is. Like, Thank God that piece of shit isn't pitching against us. Oh, that, that would suck. That you I would have chalked that. us up for a, a complete Easy game loss. shutout. Easy yeah. loss. But just you're gonna see the names, the familiar faces. Harrison Bader playing good center field. Tommy Edmond playing good second base. Like there's just a good team. They're a good team. They have nine or ten wins as it stands right now. I don't remember what happened on Sunday of them, but that's it. You just get it. This is we talked about last week being a barometer with the Giants. There's gonna be another barometer playing a team like the Cardinals, who's one of those consistently good teams, who's not going to make a lot of mistakes for you to take advantage of on the road as well. It'd be nice to get yes. another another series victory, especially on the road in St. Louis, and. That's pretty much where we're going to wrap up this episode here, guys. Not much else to talk about here on episode number 86. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Thank you for watching. Make sure you're dropping us a follow on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, at MetsUp. You'll be able to find us there. If you're listening to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, drop us a rating, drop us a review. It really does help grow the podcast. Of course, shout out to The Seven Line for helping be a part of this podcast as well. Follow me on Twitter, at Draftnik, Mark James, at Jeter Had No Range. And otherwise, we will talk to you on the next episode to talk about the Cardinal series and preview those filthy fillies. Mm-hmm. Peace out, guys. See you next time.